with this consciousness work, if you're trying to like wake up to your true nature, you're fucking with the most powerful force in the universe. Bourbon Street, baby. So you better be careful. You either start it and you finish it, or you don't start it at all. You fear to go into those mines. The dwarves delve too greedily and too deep. You know what they awoke in the darkness of Khazadu. Shadow and flame. Let authenticity make the noise. Anyone with the right practice can attain some of the highest stages of consciousness and abide in what sages and mystics have been talking about since the beginning of time. There are infinite numbers of ways to get there. To me, birthdays are about celebrating the present moment because we're born and reborn every nanosecond. I documented my entire journey from the first sit all the way to the Big Bang. Woo! Duality. As a matter of direct experience, the mind and the body are in consciousness. We flip ourselves inside out. Yeah! From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, I fought him in the power of Morgoth. See, a good representation of the awakened state is like an animal documentary, planet Earth or our planet, where all organisms survive through interdependency without a central agent or a controller. It's more like that than fractal DMT trip animations or chakras you ejaculating out of your spine, angels or gods. But it's also that too, because it includes everything. See, every event and phenomenon is dependent on webs and webs of conditions from the future to the past. That arises, this also arises. This ceases, that also ceases. So you dissolve the separate self with awareness. Darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time. Stars wheeled overhead, and every day was as long as a life age of the Earth. Become one in the eyes of love. Oh, the objective is to dissolve every speck of solidity that separates you from the rest of the universe and merge with infinity. I suspect that everything we do in life are keyholes to this end. Yeah, I started out with, um, well, I've been an artist all my life, but then as a teenager, I got into bodybuilding and stuff like that just because I wanted to be more athletic and also I wanted to impress, you know, my schoolmates. I uh, wanted to like run faster, jump higher, get stronger, also to get girls. <clears throat> I could never get a girlfriend in high school. And so like fitness was like where my ego is uh, very attached to during that phase, um, early 20s, uh, all the way to like maybe like early 30s. So I, I've always been really obsessed with the body. Uh, with um, just athleticism, things like that. Also art and how that relates to each other. And then, um, you know, after building up the body, I started to see, you know, you have to build up the mind as well. So I started to get into, like you said, philosophy, psychology, and then eventually psychedelics uh, for a little bit, um, and then meditation, and which pretty much ties everything together. Um, 
yeah, you know, first you're the body, then your mind, and then your consciousness, then you transcend even consciousness. Then we can talk about what that means too. Another uh, parallel between fitness and uh, contemplative fitness and uh, spiritual practice is no bullshit. If you're not making a shift in your moment-to-moment -moment direct experience, quote-unquote physically, like switching from 720 uh, and then upgrading to 1080 and then to uh, 4K and then 4K 360 and then 8K 360, or if you're not dissolving the separate self from solidity to water to air, <laughs> then you are not making gains. It's visceral, embodied, universe flexing itself. Too many people are mentally masturbating instead of mentally lifting. And of course, throughout this whole journey, it's not just about you know upgrading. It's all about um, also about shredding away, uh, shredding away of conditionings and uh, lays, uh, lenses of perceptions and solidities, traumas in the body. Because, um, like you said, it's not really uh, attainment. I mean, on one level, you can say it's attainment. And Buddhists use that term, you know, attainment a lot. But on, on the other hand, it's just uncovering what's already there. And the only reason why you're not already recognizing your true nature, which is you know boundless and timeless and spontaneous and vast and uh, is because of all the you know layers of uh, solidity so conditionings and, and shadows and you know karmas that's in the way so this work is just as about you know attaining higher consciousness as much as about just shredding away and healing shredding away the things that get in the way which in order to do that you have to heal and healing to me just means you know integrating um the solidity of the mitsu to you know, the empty, vast space of a presence. Yeah, once you integrate something in simultaneously, you make it disappear as well. You lose the identification with whatever part of you that you're identifying with. Yeah. yeah because yeah. identity plays a big role, you know, like the only reason why we feel like we're, we're traumatized um, because we have expectations. Yeah, and expectations makes us feel like we're victims. We're victims to a version of reality that cannot possibly exist. There's only one version of reality, which is what's going on right now. That's it. So every time we have an expectation and wish that or hope that or expect that there's a version of reality other than what's presented right here, right now, we accumulate some traumas. So that I think is the root of trauma, pretty much. Just yeah. expecting about the past or the future or you know, just uh, ruminating about the past expecting the future that will never come but you know in this uh, space of presence is timeless it is timeless and spaceless and dimensionless so all those things don't really exist on, on the optimal level yes and i think when you say that um basically having expectations um kind of in that sense <clears throat> seemingly separates you from your true true core or true nature right then of course maybe people think okay what does that mean um i don't have expectations but of course Stuff like that can tend to be really unconscious and subtle. You're right. right? Mm -hmm. So um, what I found in my personal journey is that, for example, I started personally also a lot with like um, traditional self-help and personal development, like all the way of self-optimization. And then I saw I kind of, okay, I, I reached a certain limit where I kind of try to fix stuff. And instead of like, loving stuff and kind of looking what's actually there and wants to be integrated and released mm -hmm. and and then even from there i saw okay there is a certain limit as this is still something like acted out of a certain resistance try to have everything perfect all the time be completely whole and, in and integrated right so then of mm -hmm. course like non-duality got me more into okay it's literally about accepting everything that's there and when i saw that yeah that everything okay even i thought i would do really consciously investigate and inquire about where like are my shadows and where are beliefs that are holding me back like in the end there was still try um kind of an attempt to escape this reality for example through shadow work right mm -hmm. and so i think what meditation then helped me really and and the non-dual philosophy and approach and um, was really to see that um, with higher resolution, kind of what these expectations are, even what these constructs are, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Re releasing resistance is the entire path, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. But that's you said it done. You know, as long as you're not resisting to what is, then you're in the flow. Yeah. So, like, I guess realization is kind of like entering a permanent flow state, except that you know when 
when there's no one here nor there that's floating with anything, it's not really a state anymore. It's not a temporary state. It's just the isness and nature is always flowing. Yeah. And yeah. can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? Since, for example, when right. when I do coaching sessions with people, a lot of people come to me and of course they want to feel better, right? They want to change right. dates. And so when you then work with them on many sessions, they feel kind of relief and they say, okay, it's pr there's a progress and improvement and I feel better and I um, work more on myself and um, I get better life quality and I work on my psychology and stuff and that's all great. But then um, in the end, all the states are always changing, right? They're not, they're not permanent. And if you try to like grasp certain, uh, like, like hold on to certain states and have expectations of, okay, I will be happy on, on a state level now forever, then this creates or sets you up for basically more suffering, right? So what do you mean when there's like, it's not a state or it's a stateless state? Well, yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about happiness, you know, ha I guess this state, if I could describe it uh, using one word to do, pinpoint which emotion it is, I would say it's happiness, but without conditionings. So happiness independent of conditionings. Yeah. So that kind of happiness um, is a little different from the happiness that codependent arises with sadness. You know, the happiness that you feel on the contracted level, which is the same as sadness, actually, because pleasure and pain actually are the same thing. We think we want pleasure, right? But then if you really examine it, our body is actually afraid of pleasure. This is the same way that it's afraid of pain because both come from a contraction. The only reason why you feel like something is pleasant is because of the release of contraction, right? To expansion. So they're actually just two sides of the same coin. So the, the happiness I'm talking about is independent of that expanding and contraction. It's almost like happiness with a capital H. It, it feels like, It feels like happiness, but then it's not really located anywhere in the body. It's just spread out through the entire universe, so to speak. So that kind of happiness, even when things don't go your way, you still enjoy every moment because you're not attached to whether I want to be happy or not. You're not attached to whether getting this will make me happy or not. So it's a kind of, um, I guess, in other words, equanimity. But then this equanimity is not like, It, it doesn't feel like empty. It feels like, it feels like love. Yeah. That's how I can say. It. Yeah. But again, it's not, it, it is kind of, it's not the love with, you know, from a mental woman, of course, that's, in, you know, nested within that as well. Everything's nested within the ultimate because the ultimate yeah. relative I want. It's the kind of, it's the love with a capital L is unconditional love, which is not an, a human emotion. It, it's just the isness. It, it's, it's hard to describe what it is really. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I think for many people starting out, And really targeting this video right now more to people like mm. being more on like and maybe level of fascination curiosity and feeling drawn to that but not having like had certain glimpses or insights but i think it's really hard to imagine what what does it mean love is not a human emotion yeah. um because of course we we um tend to have a re like resolution of experience where we just mm -hmm. render everything through emotions and through sensations right but then it's actually possible to discover a ground that is right. not actually separate from the sensations and the emotions, right. but identical at the same time. Exactly. But exactly. yeah, it's uh, simultaneously mm -hmm. um, feels like, oh, wow, yeah, there's this piece. I, I now get it. It's kind of mm -hmm. like um, proving itself through itself that it's there. It's kind of obvious, right? right. Then, yeah, it, yeah. It's like the, uh, like you said, the ground. It's like the, the ground in which all emotions, good and bad, quote unquote, are arising from and through but it's simultaneously outside of it but it gives rise to it as well so it's a paradox that cannot be grasped with the mind yeah. i want to read you something that i just kind of wrote this morning it kind of maybe sums up this a little bit life is one seamless and flawless flow of synchronicities where everything just unfolds magically in the timeless and boundless presence past future and present uh, exist simultaneously And they're all talking to each other to make every moment perfect. So the panoramic awareness that I talk about doesn't just apply to space, but to time as well, because space and time are just one fabric and both are fabrications of the mind. So that's another paradox. It's like the most fundamental thing, but it's still a fabrication, right? So none of that has any essence and that's emptiness. And we can talk about that. Why, why accessing emptiness is also accessing love. So planning is impossible without a doer things just happen you know decisions simply appear out of nowhere belonging to no one and thoughts have nothing to do with whatever is happening or is going to happen 
the simply layovers that are usually unnecessary, selfing added on to whatever is already happening. Another way to describe the present moment is an infinite Mandela, with each part giving rise to the whole and vice versa. And they're all codependent rising to make this moment a spontaneous perfection. Ultimately, the Mandela is always full because it's always empty and nothing can be taken away or added to it. Each time you think a piece goes missing, another piece pops up to fill up the hole at the exact moment. Yeah. You might not experience it or know it until quote unquote, later on if you're operating on a conventional time, but it's how it is. If you're sad because you experience a loss, it is because you're not experiencing the Mandela from the holistic non-perspective of non-duality where everything is happening all at once while nothing ever happened. So there's no here nor there. So it's always here and you've never gone anywhere. Yeah. That's really beautiful. I think I have to rewatch it in order to like grasp the, the, the fullness of what you just shared. But one thing just stick to me, like right at the beginning where you shared about the um, constant, perfect stream of synchronicities. Right. <clears throat> and I... um heard you saying in one of your videos that in in terms of healing it's like that life always gives you exactly what needs to be healed right now and what's no, no. What, what needs to address right now yes yes which is because of, it can't be any other way it cannot be any other way exactly yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of the mandala right it's like right. with shadow work the, the the universe or whatever you want to call it life is always going to give you the exact thing that you need to work with so you have to trust the process. You have to have, you know, quote unquote, faith in the process. Like you yeah. see, to, you start to see that uh, more and more clearly uh, as the the path progresses, as you get deeper into truth, and the more you align to your true nature, that's going to be even more and more obvious. It's like you have a thing in your life, and then this thing happened, this emotional story happens, or something happens with your girlfriend, or with your boss at work. In that moment, that's what you have to work with. It's perfect imperfection. It's, it's when you like when you're in the midst of the darkness, whether it's my more psychological or more existential, spiritual dark night, whatever. You feel like there's a lack of trust that everything kind of unfolds as, as it should, right? Mm. And for me, what I found out that like non like when you boil it down, of course, non duality is pretty simple. It's just there's just one truth, and can I trust that this is true? That's mm -hmm. it. But in moments of dark night, where a lot of resistance is coming up and all your patterns of maybe conditioning that right. you couldn't deal with successfully in the past that you couldn't integrate, you're uh -huh. still faced with the self at uh, the same powerlessness or helplessness or depression or whatever, right? right. And this also like then shows you where you can't trust life, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can't trust this here, that this moment is perfect. Yeah. If you could, if you could, had like an vision of the future that you would come out the other way and it's fine again mm. then maybe you could surrender here and there right. right now and even enjoy the pain like you said right. pain and uh, pleasure is kind of the same right, right. you right. could even enjoy the pain then it's something that right. exactly that's a good one yeah yeah I, I i call us the existential king like this is one of one book author writes about that she basically says i don't know caroline elliott i think is her name and she basically says she imagines God to be like this um, huge, infinite, um, hermaphrodite super freak who has every kink. And basically, mm -hmm. he experiences itself through the different avatars by right. having a blast with every experiencing, as well with the like joyful emotions, but also right. all the drama and suffering, right? And but of course, we as identified with the body mind I, I can't always access that um, perspective. But indeed, the, the more and the longer you're on a journey, um, the more you trust through direct insights and through all the evidence that you accumulated that always when I'm coming into the darkness, light comes again, which is impermanence, right? Mm -hmm. That surrender becomes more habitual, becomes more uh, something you would. Um, like put all your chips on in 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 doubt uh, or in a situation where you when you like it, when it's black and white should i stay in contraction or resistance and and stay in my mind or, or do i now say i do the thing that's crazy i do the thing that's maybe irrational and i completely open up and um give myself to god or to grace or whatever then i think this um 
muscle of letting go builds up um through that is at least something that happened to me through like dark nights repeating themselves after and after and after and after until at some point it's kind of okay probably this time it will end up fine as well even though every time it feels like a completely new thing and completely unknown again (laughs) right yeah yeah i like what you said about um enjoying uh pain because when i said um our body is terribly afraid of pleasure that's the same way as saying we actually in some sense love the pain yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. the acceptance of both pleasure and pain is what gives rise to non-duality yeah and yeah. yeah that's also some really um i think perspective that you don't have every day Because you try to, of of course, avoid suffering and avoid bad emotions, but Mm -hmm. thinking about actually, I feel love or I fear ecstasy or I fear expansion and I fear freedom, right? And and boundlessness. Mm -hmm. That's something not many people um, think that much about all the time. Right. I personally, when I, talking a bit about psychedelics, when I had my first um, encounter with 5-Mu DMT with Buffalo Values, I so exactly like what that means it's like yeah because you need to give up everything and joy enjoy nothing yeah. is no attachment stays where it is right you lose everything <laughs> right, right, right yeah so you can be, be groundless yeah and um, maybe bringing it a bit more, more more from the um because we went already into really um, deep topics but bringing it more back onto practical terms of, of, of sure. therapy um yeah for example when you do a lot of and now speaking again to people being on the path of shadow work and healing and um personal development what sometimes happens is um when you're doing it for a certain while you kind of stay stuck in a certain paradigm and right not you you have more like i would call it horizontal development in, instead mm-hmm. of vertical development right. right in terms of your consciousness and then when you start questioning certain core beliefs with self-inquiry for example am i really a separate entity before you try to improve the separate entity but then you ask the question is this even is it even there in the first place like the no self right and then all of a sudden a, a completely new layer of shadow material gets mm-hmm. unlocked right and so yeah what are your experience or your take on that that the more i think also you in one video you said the more awake you are or conscious you are the more you are prepared to kind of process through deeper layers of suffering right, right. Yeah. The, the brighter the light the deeper you can go to yeah. see your traumas are and sometimes the brighter the light the dirty the windshield too mm. so Sometimes you have a release or an opening to like truth or no self, even more stuff comes out than you didn't realize before. And then some people can start to feel even more unawakened than they had the glimpse. And, but that's actually normal. You know, you just got to cycle between, you know, the expansion and contraction over and over and over again. Each time you expand, each time you have an opening, more stuff comes out and then it yeah. gets integrated, gets dissolved, gets released. Once that gets released by default, more spaciousness opens up, more light comes in. And then the yeah. deeper layer you go on and on and on. So yeah. that cycle of contraction, expansion, or you know, waking up, waking down, or waking up, cleaning up, waking up, cleaning up, that cycle goes on before awakening, during awakening, and even after awakening. And what is that cycle? It's the same cycle as dark night and uh, the spiritual highs. That is just the cycle of life, of nature, right? Expansion, contraction, yin and yang. That's the truth of... Um, of the nature of the mind you know when buddha said he figured out the truth of uh the nature or the, the truth of the mind or the truth of reality he's talking about that pretty much and you you can't really understand non-duality if you don't understand that simultaneity of expansion and contraction how everything just arises out of this duality of yin and yin. yeah and yeah right and even then also seeing that also the contraction is perfect because right um, if you try to get rid of the contraction, you are in contraction in a certain right. sense. But in the same time, of course, you need to like practice and have the focus of what's true. Um, yeah, one one question I want to ask, that's many, many of my clients have this question. Um, they kind of can't really um, 
bring together the paradox of okay you okay when you are awake or when you're in non-duality how can it be possible that there are still triggers for example which mm -hmm. is right which is maybe something out of an apparent ego structure or, or trauma based right and then the answer i always give is um that basically okay there's a trigger but no one is triggered in the first place that's because that completely changes the relationship to what's ever going on and when there is no one triggered then actually what happens the field opens up by that so through not having a problem with contraction so to speak you come basically automatic in expansion again which is then equanimity and or acceptance and owning whatever is going on there and then healing can happen because you're not in resistance anymore right yeah right yeah, <clears throat> I mean, there are, you know, uh, levels of non-duality as well. You yeah. know, um, non-duality also has depth to it. Yeah. Um, when the center disappears, um, then I, I would say before the center disappears, the, it's the fluctuation. There, there's still a fluctuation between, you know, truth and everything else uh, or between uh, just permanent locking and non-dual awareness versus going back to sleep. But when the, after the center disappears, um, there can still be things that come up, but then there's going to be no one there to uh, hijack it, or there's going to be no one there to uh, cling on to whatever is arising, and it's just going to spontaneously be dissolved into the vast spaciousness. Mm -hmm. But before the center is dissolved, um, a lot of the times, the rest of the ego structure is going to create another identity through uh, the process of cleaning. So you're kind of creating uh, a cleaner ego. Yes. Yep. That's why a lot yep. of people get stuck in there because like, instead of just dissolving that solidity and, and um, dissolving the center forever, um, they're just going in a circle and, and try to clean up uh, the rest of the conditioning with more conditioning. That's why in one of my videos, I said, um, if you don't wake up and then clean up, it's almost like putting lipstick on a pig. You're just replacing conditioning with prettier conditionings, but it's, it's still conditions. So whenever your mind is starting to generate a lot of stories about like you as a character, as a healer, going through this entire process, uh, linking back to the traumas of your parents and whatever, um, just remember that whatever sensations are rising now, it doesn't have stories. It's just the levels of contraction and expansion. It's a very visceral and, and very embodied feeling of whether you're contracted or not. And then you work with that contraction or that solidity right here and now. Yeah. So that's a more like a, a, a more radical and non dual approach to clinical shadow work. But again, like I said earlier in my in last call, sometimes it's still important to work the content. That's why a lot of teachers recommend you going to a therapist. You know, if you don't wake up first and then clean up, yeah. you're always going to be creating another identity yes yes because the rest of the solidity is always going to morph itself because the ego is such a cheeky con it's yeah. always going to morph itself into another identity and the identity could be the spiritual seeker it could be the one that's obsessed with jhanas and alter state of consciousness it could be the one that's obsessed with cleaning yeah when so, in fact that's the thing that needs to go with the, with the meditator yeah you know the whole point is not to become a, a better vipassionalizer or a meditator is to see that there was never a meditator there in the first yeah, one. Yeah. So you but you know, throughout the path, it's all about fake it until you make it. You know, and sometimes you have to create some kind of a seeker or create an observer, or create a cleaner to do the cleaning. But then if you're aware of it, you if you're aware that that's an anchor, then you know the process can go a lot quicker. But if, but if you're not aware of it, then you're just kind of operating through another lens of perception. Exactly. So that's basically what what I would call like that's shadows of shadow work itself. Right, right. That's like interesting. Before or like a healing trap right mm -hmm. and so i think what's important is to always have like a balance because sometimes you think like it's black and white and what's the right approach what's the right meditation technique what's the and you want to have it really simple like of course it should be simple but not um, simpler than reality actually is right and of, it seems like it's important even of course i think every journey is so unique and sacred and like to what used to about sacred in the sense of um you, no journey will be the same that, that the other there will always be like like you said it's always with a piece of art like a mandala every single journey i guess of every mm -hmm. human right. but i think one ingredient that kind of seems to correlate with um getting further on the on the path and um, seems to be like balancing 
um, on the one side, the element of, yeah, like cleaning up or like working on the content, but at the same time, kind of cleaning up the cleaning up or cleaning up the cleaner, so to speak. Yeah, so right, 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 right. Meta perspective and a really then the literal yeah. perspective. Right. right. You know, that's that's a mind fuck sometimes for many people. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, you, it, you try it to re solve the tool right. with which yeah, brings yeah, you yeah. further, and that's counterintuitive yeah. to the yeah. mind because you, course, you can yeah. attach to that what gets you to what A to B, but that what gets you to A to B obviously sometimes yes not, get you to from B to C, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a it's a catch twenty two. Yeah. yeah. So I, sometimes I say this whole path is about going meta until the the meta loops closes on itself. And yeah. It's no more like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's tricky yeah but then the, the waking up and the cleanup process isn't like exclusive as well you know there's actually just one thing you know and yeah. also the, like i said earlier you go on cycles and cycles of this so it's not like you know there's waking up and then clean up it's not so sequential you know there's like macro cycles and then there's mm -hmm. like micro cycles within the macro cycle but then of course like i think in general um for most people if they focus only on the cleaning up and they don't know anything about um, awakening or non-duality, it's easier to get stuck there. Yeah. 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 But if you only focus on the waking up part, you can wake up. But then if you don't uh, put in the foundation of doing the cleaning work or the shadow work, even if you wake up and are is abiding in non-duality and, and dissolve the center, there can still be traumas and conditionings and shadows that did not get addressed which is why a lot of like, spiritual teachers, you see them like behave very badly. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the duality can even uh, bypasses and sort of suppress some of the, uh, the traumas because when you're in on duality, it's the, the vast spaciousness is so incredibly vast. Like sometimes the, all the small human stuff, you could easily, you know, just gaslight it or, you know, choose not to look at it or even you can't even see it. Yeah. yeah. So, but then like it, to enter non-duality, you have to dissolve a large chunk of condition already. Right? But that doesn't mean, so let's say, okay, yeah. I'm just going to put a number on it, but these numbers are obviously arbitrary. Let's say 98% of the solidity in your body has to be dissolved for, mm -hmm. the, for the loop to close it on itself. But then uh, the rest of the 2%, I mean, they're very deep. And then when they come out, they can be terribly like uh, powerful. You know, like that's... That's, I think, the difference between uh, awakening and liberation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The last 2%? Yeah, it's just an arbitrary number. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. sure, sure. In, in order, like when I had my permanent shift on in, in 2020, in May 2020, which um, was an on and off switch, it was like, boom, it was gone. Like the center never returned. Even after that, there were still like very deep conditionings that were slowly getting integrated to truth. Yeah. And that process before, uh, I think a lot of teachers talk about this as well, that process of integration, post-awakening integration, it can take forever, or usually it takes up to like seven years for everything to be completely settled in. But even after that, there's still you know further refinements, right? So, so in order to make that flip, you have to you know dissolve most of your karmas already, or else that that leap is going to be impossible. But even after that, there's still some uh, a lot of integration work to do, actually, even though it's just you know happening by itself after after that point. Yeah. What for? What's your view on, for example, when you you're doing a spiritual practice, for example, vipassana meditation or other spiritual practices, and then you encounter some trauma surfacing? Then one way, of course, of dealing with that is just staying observant and equanimous and letting it resolve by itself and mm -hmm. more often than not this will work right mm -hmm. and it's, it will even work in in the beauty that you see healing can be so simple without me having to do some fancy technique or intervention right, right? yeah right but there are times where it doesn't as mm -hmm. at least i saw in my journey I, of course i can't go back in time and maybe everything is of course, it happens like it should happen, but I also saw there were some stuff um, coming up where I then I went to a um, to a therapist, for example, or I went through a, to a healer, or I took some psych psychedelic sub substance, which would then help me to work through that on a content level, which then opened up more consciousness points or whatever you want to call it, which helped me then or enabled me to um, go deeper. Mm -hmm. So, what is your experience with that and? 
how would you do you have any like rules of thumb or like indicators um when to do what and when is it a sign of resistance to go into the content and when should you just go into the content or sometimes it's maybe just stay with it feel it through but i also have many clients that say oh i, I have this anxiety um feeling in my gut since five months and i just feeling but it's not changing for example right yeah, yeah. On, that. Uh, uh, on the ultimate level there there's no such thing as trauma there, there's no nothing to heal there's no such thing as conditions because whatever you think is trauma or, or conditioning only exists within time like whatever is happening right now without the stories and the narratives you're attaching to it it's just some contractions in the body physical contraction in the body at the sensorial level and you can just kind of release that in the moment um because like any narrative that you uh, generate to attach to this solidity has nothing to do with what happened in the past because yeah, your mind actually has no access to whatever happened in the past and then ultimately you know like there's nothing to heal that's another point I w wanted to make is that awakening doesn't happen in time or space so there is no progression at all you're awake now or you're never right? but on the other hand here's the paradox again there is a progression when you your mind started to generate stories about like your past, your karma, what my parents did, uh, my exes did this, that's why I'm wounded here now. Um, all that stuff. Uh, yes, it's true on the conventional level, but on the ultimate level, on the level of presence, there's nothing to heal because there's no time. How can there be anything to heal when there's no time and there's no space, right? So that's on the ultimate level. But on the conventional level, like we talked about earlier, you need to like use a story to uh, release a story. Just like Ramana Rahashi said, um, Maharshi said that you need to use the thorn of a rose to remove another thorn until you throw them both away. So it's sometimes it's important to work with the content through content. Other times it's just as important to just let go and surrender and realize that there is nothing to heal and then just let whatever solidity or contractions uh, dissolve and release them in this moment. Yes, it's one way to just deal with it immediately. Just like, okay, the present sensation has no story. There's nothing to heal. There's no such thing as conditioning. That's all just stuff in the dream world. It's one way to attack it. But sometimes that doesn't always work. Like you said, some sensations are so heavy and uh, you sort of need to work with the stories. But then the stories is also an illusion, but you, you work with the illusion to dissolve an illusion until both dissipate. Just like Ramana Mahashi said, you use the thorn of a rose to remove another thorn until they both disappear and they both are removed. Now, when you work with the contractions, uh, you can either just go in there and deconstruct it and see through the emptiness of it, or you can just let things be exactly the way they are without trying to change you without any judgments and just give it love, right? Again, effort and effortlessness, you end up in the same spot. So when should you go to the content and when should you just kind of abide in, in the vast stillness and vast spaciousness and let the condition dissolve on its own through love or whatever, acceptance, surrendering. Um, most of it is intuition, at least in yes. my journey, intuition. Yeah. The more, the deeper you go into the journey, the more intuition you have on what to do. But at first it can be a little tricky. So I guess at first you can kind of divide your practice into uh, different phases, I guess, you know, maybe, you know, in this phase, so the first 30 minutes of my practice, I'm going to you know, do some Vipassana and then just go in there and, and, and you know, dissolve the solidity. Oh, that, that's a slightly different um, different approach to Vipassana, but we, we can talk about Vipassana later. But yeah. we, I'm just you know, using that as an example. You can divide your practice into different, you know, phases of different blocks. Okay, in this, you know, first 30 minutes, I'm just, uh, I'm going to work with the content. And the later 30 minutes, I'm just going to like go and surrender, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There are obviously ways to combine both and right. let them of even course. synergize with each right. other. And yeah, of course. Uh, Ultimately, this is one practice. This is one path. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they all converge. And when solidities arise, when, when and traumas arise, usually there are just two ways that you can go about it. One is just to see through this emptiness, through Vipassana. Just get the insights into the nature of the experience, you know, yeah. the three characteristics of Buddhism, you know, no self, impermanence, and suffering. So you, you do Vipassana, you practice with Vipassana and use the laser beam of your attention or awareness and then penetrate the solidity and see through clearly that it's empty. It's, it's a mental fabrication. That's one way. Another way is just to let it be there 
and just surrender. That's you know contraction versus expansion. You know, vipassana, you kind of need to contract and sort of use the laser beam of the awareness to dissolve the sensation and see the insight. And the expansion, you just surrender and just let love dissolve the solidities. Right. Usually, yeah. the, the, that's the, the two ways that you can go about it. Yeah. yeah. Or you can sort of combine them as well, like in vipassana, like the Michael Tap meditation, where you, you abide in the vast spaciousness, um, and then you investigate the nature of sensation through that vast spaciousness, what I call, you know, vipassionalizing through the God mind, so to speak. Yeah. So I guess working with content is, is somewhere in, in the middle of that, or it, working with the content is a little bit of both, I guess, right? Because in vipassana, you can, you can just see through the emptiness of um, sensations without even going to the content. Yeah. So I, I also really love what you um, said really in the beginning on intuition basically the rule of thumb is okay it's intuitive and i think even that is also basically a matter of trust that trust yeah. trust, trust your conscious or your experience of consciousness and trust god working for you if you want to call it that right yeah yeah yeah, exactly trust, trust, your, vehicle, trust your vehicle right yeah and yeah. i think the synchronicity is the density of synchronicity and the obviousness of synchronicities gets Increasing. clearer and clearer and obvious yeah. and more obvious and then it's yeah. really a matter of what do I rely on? Do I rely on mind, on plans? Do I look like what is he doing? What, what is the person left um, from me? On, on what journey is he? And But what's my experience? And in the end, it's, it's hammering in this one thing of my experience has authority. And I'm I'm kind of the guru in the end. Right. Yeah, the uh, the only guru in the end. Not, you're you're not the guru, but the nature is the guru. So exactly. You like, are, you yeah, are nature. There's just, no, there's there's nature. just guru. There's just guru. Yeah. Like, there's just guru because like yeah. nature is always gonna know what to do. Nature will always take the course of the least resistant with yeah. the most harm if you just yeah. leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why going back to the flow state, you know, when you dissolve the the ego, there's nothing but the flow because nature itself is always just flowing. So. It's not like you gain some magical power by meditating and now your Kundalini has this like third eye that knows what to do. It's not really like that. It's like once you dissolve the um, the conditionings and, and the filters that are in the way, nature is going to take care of itself. Yeah. 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 Me, it was the experience of, um, I saw, like, for, I had one Bufo Alvarius um, uh, uh, five mu DMT ceremony, and there it felt like, oh, I literally know everything, right? But then, mm -hmm in that sense it was it, it felt like that this was just the experience but in on a more human level it feels like i know also everything but just everything that needs to be known in this moment mm -hmm. um, to get to the next step kind of right and i think we're so often like what, what what in spiritual circles they call living in the future often and um, refers to is trying to know more than is necessary to know right now which creates all kind of worries and fears and right. like anxiety and and overthinking and over planning and perfectionism even right and just um yeah and for me i i'm curious if you also had similar experiences but definitely that's something for me and something i observe also with other and people <laughs> that at a certain point i couldn't really function with my mind anymore so where in the, in the in the in the past it was like i was really good in like structuring and scripting and planning and and, and stuff like that and up until a certain point, it just didn't make any sense. It was like a lower paradigm attempt mm -hmm. to yeah. functioning in life, where now it feels like I'm I'm still doing all of that, but it's more doing me when when it's done. For example, I I need to do my taxes or stuff like that. And then where where in the in the past it was like I judged myself for procrastinating. And I should do it by Sunday, for example. Now it's mm -hmm. like I trust that my kind of intuition or whatever it is kind of already knows when to do it um in what way and it's it's it feels like it's already it already happened and then when i trust that it turns out that everything is unfolding perfectly right or other example creating a video or like um preparing myself for a therapy session or a coaching session or stuff like that it's, al it's always like okay i don't need to know it all right now and um, the, the right informations come to me um to the right time and also my way to function as a human in a really relative and human um, level also um, comes to me. But there was literally, and um, there were literally times where I just sat there and I was like in this trap of, 
not it's not maybe a trap but more more phase of also where your normal motivational structure kind of rewires mm -hmm. and where it's not coming now from habitual patterns and and automatisms but but more it kind of it um, feels like it unplugs and i was just sitting there passive um and there was no action impulse in any direction i literally it was, nothing makes and even like brushing my teeth or like reading a book or doing stuff that i used to do in the past or that interested me in the past everything was kind of why why am i doing it and there's no one doing it um anyway it was kind of in this 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 past of um passive and uh, in, in this um, um trap of passivity i would call mm -hmm. it, which, which was also good to see even if my if i let allow myself to surrender in doing completely nothing in the end impulses to act come at exactly the right time without me having to force them so that me exactly. something something big right yeah exactly yeah just like i said earlier there, you, there's no planner uh yeah this, this just kind of happened on their own yeah, yeah. and then all this thing thoughts about like planning or you know the, the would haves could haves and should haves all those thoughts would dissolve because you realize they're they're just layovers on top of what's already happening which is just for this you know it can't be any other way yeah so the plan like you said there's there, there can still be planning and decision making but it doesn't it, it feels like the planning and decision making is doing you just like the breath yeah. is breathing you you're not creating the breath yeah yeah so that really takes uh, away a lot of uh, anxieties uh, in day-to-day -day life yeah the first month some yeah in the end it, it takes away and first uh, sometimes it adds or reveals more if you are really attached to control for example right because mm -hmm. it, it, in that moment it feels like losing control over your life everything is crumbling or you allow everything to crumble that seem to be stable or reliable mm -hmm. right right yeah 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 another duality that gets uh closed is the duality between the ego the, the personal will and the divine will yeah yeah when that duality disappears it neither exists really you know the the, yeah. the duality the oneness and separateness also collapses yeah because a lot of people on the path they, they always have this question about like oh if i enter on duality if i recognize no self am i going to still uh do all those things that the ego used to do Right. The answer is you don't know. And whatever you let go of, if you truly enter another duality, you're not going to care. And whatever you continue to do, now might resemble the ego stuff before. When you do them, they're just spontaneous and you don't contract. There's no suffering in it. You're not attached to the outcome. You just enjoy the process as itself. So it's a women situation. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's, I always say like with realization, you're just kind of going back to the, the way this Mitsu has always been wired mm -hmm. to do even on the conventional level for example like I like filming things I like creating art mm -hmm. and I'm still doing that because that's just part of my DNA and I'm doing it more efficiently and my work uh, flow and work capacity is increased mm -hmm. but with like no attachment to the outcome so like you don't have to worry about like you know am I gonna still make music after realization if you don't then you're you're, you're not meant to do that exactly yeah, there's no point in thinking about that really <laughs> yeah. yeah i always always say um what is left over or, or the person you become um is kind of exactly what you want to become on your on the deepest level yeah um, exactly yeah. yeah because the yeah, like, like the your true the ego or the the the, the conventional self's true nature will ultimately yeah. verge with the true nature of exactly. uh, nature yeah and it's <laughs> like the, the all the personal desires kind of they kind of relativize themselves or and, yeah. and then the unpersonal desire which is really your true authentic core desire of what you want to express out of your deep soul there's more space for that to flow out mm -hmm. of them, right exactly yeah yeah totally. and then it's, yeah and that's for me like really the the, the um that's for me true self-love or true self-expression then and for me it's really yeah. I, I always had to slow authenticity yeah, authenticity. Let for me, it's yeah. called, let authenticity make the noise. It's the yeah. follow. I follow just this one mantra. This was everything I did for for years, and of course, I I needed to go through different blockages I had and anxieties and shame and 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 guilt uh, stuff, and and looking at uh, what's my true nature, 
And but this was always like Joseph Campbell calls it follow your bliss, follow your joy, yeah. any inspiration, mm-hmm. follow, just follow your heart and stuff like that. It's right. true. In the end, it was like for me, it was that just let authenticity make the noise. And then everything that's false, which is basically what, what the seeming ego is, and just just drops away eventually. And then you see that's what's left. That's really you. And what I really come to realize is that ego is actually the inflammation of your personality. So it's not like you're trying because many people think you 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 then don't have a personality anymore. And after you wake up, for me, it's more no the inflammation that's already existing around your personality. This kind of like um, this heals or um, cools down, and then everything is more clear and efficient and um, yeah integrated. So yeah, so, yeah. yeah, as it should exactly. be or as it, as it is meant to be. So right like, yeah. yeah totally i totally agree yeah which is something that i really admire in in your work as like the way you produce content and and how you like the videos you put out and also on instagram for example that's really like fresh and pure and it has i feel it has a really it has so much juice in it for me personally as I, and i think many people perceive it in that way mm-hmm. and what i really um I always recommend you um, to people that kind of also have the idea that self-realization looks like you are now a 60-year-old guy sitting on a chair and <laughs> holding a satsang or sitting in a cave and you're really like <laughs> this one-dimensional character, right? But it can yeah. be. It could be like that. Yeah, that, yeah. that, that could be how it unfolds for some people. But then um, it, if that is how you unfold for that particular person, that's their nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah some people like to go to the cave, you know, just, you know? yeah. yeah but but um i would say for the most part um i think most people just continue to do what they were doing before but just yeah. like you said with an even more authenticity and um and i've been like talking about like authenticity a lot like the video i'm editing right now this part about authenticity about how like you know like a lot of like artists and athletes they they have the like, it factor you know that people call like aura and uh, that's just the same word as authenticity, really. And yeah. they're just tapping into being, really, because being, being is always, uh, yeah, being is always authentic. And you know, some people that if you see some artwork, it's like this doesn't really feel uh, like there's a flow to it. This doesn't feel like it has that that juice, like you said. Yeah, yeah, because there, there's it's filtered, it's blocked by something that isn't allowing the nature's authenticity to flow. And a lot of like you know artwork if you look at it it was like wow that's like they're like well that's so real or like mm. the, 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 there's a certain like it's factor in there that just hits you in the core of your being yeah or, or it happened, it's, directly yeah. into meditativeness yeah exactly but that's the same energy as awakening yeah exactly yeah. but exactly. that that energy is actually funny because that's just the life force and that yeah. energy can be creative but it, it can also be destructive so yeah. that's why a lot of artists before awakening, or well, not even artists, just a lot of seekers before awakening, they're super, you know, so contracted, they're addictive to like, they're addicted to like drugs or sex or like whatever. Yeah. And suffering a lot. Yeah. They're very self-destructive. Right. And a lot of artists too, you know, they, they, they can create beautiful artworks, uh, but they're very destructive. Yeah. And if you don't know how to channel the energy correctly, it can also destroy you. Right. Yeah. But then if you just let the energy be as it is, you have awakening. <laughs> so it's the same force of nature that drives everything pretty much yeah and it accumulates with uh, with awakening so to speak yeah can can we switch maybe here a bit to the uh, seduction and and sex and and pickup topic since sure. for me the first thing that directly popped into my mind and it was for sure something that i went through as well is for example um like people call it in the personal development sphere or mental sphere or pickup sphere they often they try to top down act out a certain template of for example what real masculinity is supposed to look like and of course women for women this could be real femininity be expressed like the goddess be the queen stuff like and for men it's like what is what is being alpha mean for example what is what is the um what are the characteristics of an attractive guy or stuff like that and then what i always see like for example being like masculinity is just allowing life force flowing through you in the in your unity right. without any bound like without any blockages or shame or, or guilt and then yeah. your authentic masculinity comes to shine which then mm-hmm. will always have presence and depth 
and freedom of expression, right? right. But, but bottom up and not top down, right? And right. I think that's that's something where I really feel, especially pe um, people. But then, like when when people hear that, they think, oh, when I'm now into non-duality, then I be the attractive guy and this is again a personal desire and right. i know like one one teacher one of my teachers francis was here i once um, asked him okay what, what kind of what's like the non-dual approach to social anxiety for example right which is also self-expression and authenticity of course and then he said yeah so when you try to use non-duality in order to um, free yourself from social anxiety it will basically not work because um it's just it's personal desire that you're basically fueling you're fueling your ego through that and it's just mm -hmm. there's there's like it's not really sincere what you're doing you right it's not, it's not authentic it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just like when you try to be masculine you try to create an image of the masculine uh character or the yeah. feminine goddess yeah it's, you can just sense that it's not sincere and it almost seems like cringe a lot of like, like what i call spiritual cunts they're they're creating a sort of this avatar of the spiritual goddess or spiritual like you yeah. know god and yeah. then now uh, it's coming from the place of ego and separation yeah. instead of the other way around. It's something, it's something coming from the story. yeah. If you come from the perspective of the truth, that that the masculinity or the, the femininity. First of all, there's no such thing, you know, in non duality. That duality gets dissolved. Yeah. But then of course we still have the, the a body, you know, on a conventional level. I still have the penis that still have you know testosterone, and a, a female person who is a is awake, she's not just going to grow a penis. There's still a certain tendency of, of the female organism. So when you just let that, the nature's way of expressing um, femininity or masculinity is just will become a lot more authentic and sincere. And that's how you attract the opposite sex, you know, through less filtering. What, what, I, what I also found on, on my journey was since in my early 20s, I did a lot of pickup, like went to nightclubs and to streets and bars and stuff and talked like with thousands of, of girls, right? And it worked, right? So you improve yourself, there's social skill thing. Of course, it's a number numbers game and stuff like that, but you can get better. It's like playing poker and mm -hmm. also it's, it's kind of like by chance what happens, but you can have skills, right? And mm -hmm. and so of course this worked, but um what um then I had my girlfriend like four and a half years. And after that, there was an interesting period that I called the monk period. So before I called like the player period, where it's mm -hmm. more like okay, skill-based, and then what can I get? And it's kind of a bit. It was also authentic, like it was um, um, a legitimate part and a valid part of my journey. And it is right. for, for many guys, right? It's nothing to judge. But then I saw there's a, a difference in, in another paradigm that opened up and it was kind of the monk. And all of a sudden, I tried the same stuff, but it didn't work anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was complete. I, I, oh, I, okay. I call this higher self, self-sabotage that happened to me, right? Which is kind of, I didn't want the old paradigm to work anymore. It's like all my relationships have been that too. It's just like learn but don't fucking follow them like don't go with them you know interesting i definitely felt that where it's just like i can feel that every relationship is like starts off yes and then it becomes like a branch but then i'm the one that wait for uh, they always break up with me because because you end up sabotaging the relationship yep. to just continue be doing what do, yeah. do what frank does yeah. yeah okay see that's actually in a way more healthy than what i do no, really? what i do is constrict myself like, to see if I can make it work for them and then I end up losing my own like sovereignty like it's a weird like I cooperate with their view instead of just persisting in mine and letting them I see opt in or out but I feel like if you found the right person this won't be a problem because that person will be the missing piece that gets added on that makes you disappear like the Venn diagrams complete the whole it's like when, when, when you drop that point it, it goes yes. Yes, yeah, exactly. right? it's like the missing exactly. piece yeah? it's like the missing piece of the puzzle once you find that piece it will complete the 360 yeah. couldn't have said it better myself yeah. so you know what's funny it's like a reverse of dissolving everything but it's like adding that one piece so everything can be dissolved yes. so it's both the expansion and the contraction yes. happening simultaneously and then mm -hmm. I saw as I surrendered even that I saw ah now as I'm this there was the parts that were not authentic I I don't want to go to nightclubs it's actually boring me I, I have to do better stuff and stuff like that when I integrate more those aspects of myself I for example found out that then I I was more in my authentic like mm -hmm. um, alignment right. and then I was really attractive to the girls that I was really attracted to but not just on a physical level but it was just exactly this the perfect women always came into my life it was like completely different i 
didn't meet them in in nightclubs or um, on on the conventional way of where I did it, but I needed to let go of that. Like I went through all my shit with that last relationship. Yeah. She was my anchor to let go of everything, and then I had to let her go. I think I loved and suffered just as deeply in each of my relationships. See, the level of awakening directly correlates with the level of suffering that you will enter face. So I healed and wake up just a little bit more going through each relationship until the last one uh, perpetuated me all the way and we set each other free. So if a part of you dies at the end of a relationship, the enlightenment is the death of all of you. Romantic love to me is like the middleman to truth realization. It's like the small love with a, with a small L, and then you have the capital L, which is you know the love of God or emptiness. So the natural state is like taking romantic love, which is a contracted version of it, into just one person, and you smear it across the entire universe. When you fall in love with someone, the love never dies. Yeah, that's true on both the relative and the ultimate level. Wow. Because like, you know, the love of the emptiness, the, the love, the true nature never goes anywhere. So if you have the kind of love on the personal romantic level that kind of penetrates to just that relative level into the ultimate love with the capital L, then it never goes anywhere. So I think that would be the perfect merging of the big L with the small L. It's like have a romantic partner who is also tap into the ultimate love and then both of you tap into that together and still have the human aspect merging with each other and with the ultimate love so that, that's why they say the emptiness and love are identical you know it's just two sides of the same coin the, and the more empty you are the more love you experience the more full you are now i always say that when you realize something you disappear it's like when you realize god god disappears when you realize the self the self disappears right in a sense the most permanent love is the one that you've let go of there you raise the duality between life and death, permanence and impermanence. When I used to do pickup, like I, I never really follow any like techniques or any structures really. Like, do you know RSC Tyler? Yeah. Yeah. So like I went to this like YouTube um, meeting or a meetup, whatever, at like Elliot Hoss's house. And then that's where I met RSC Tyler and like Ronnie Como was there too. And then like one night, like he took us all to like to the club and he's like, okay, I'm going to show you guys what I teach my clients, but you guys get it for free. So he, you know, took, even my Kino body was there, like Greg, uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> anyway, so he took a group of us YouTubers to like to the nightclub and he was just showing us how to like do pickups as if he would like show his clients. And then I just kind of you went along with him, but then I I never really I didn't really follow him in terms of like the structures of it. I just did my own thing kind of, even though like he was showing me how to do it. And then afterwards he was like, wow, you know, Frank had a lot of success not because he followed the methods is because he was just spontaneous. He was like a yeah. little kid. He was just like a little kid who just wanted the candies. That's, that's yeah. the exact word. And then the girls were just like, well, let me kiss him and stuff like that. Because I didn't have any, you know, preconception of what I'm going to do in that moment. So I, I guess you can apply that um, process of just entering the flow. Even before I knew anything about non-duality, I was already kind of doing that. Like yeah. even not just pick up, but in like, you know, fitness and, and you know, art and, and music and things like that. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. I want to introduce you to my friend Frank. Hi. Just assume people will be nice. Go kick it with your friends and then I'll see you in a bit. Okay. It's nice to meet you. The skill that I see from you, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I can't speak for you, but just how I see it is like how I experience you is like that childlike innocence of just assuming that people will like you and even if they don't you're not reading into it and making yourself vulnerable so this is like a huge thing what we're always hammering on is make yourself 
vulnerable. This was more a thing of the paradigm, like almost a lens that you have, like goggles that you have on on how you perceive reality. And for mm -hmm. me, to a certain degree, this used to be um, this pickup paradigm. It was, for example, when for me, I walked down the street, it was always a kind of the habit of scanning where where are nice girls, for example. Like mm -hmm. this was where, where now I don't care. But when, for example, I encounter a beautiful woman, there's like inspiration, but I don't need like this this goggles on like this was um like kind of um sneaky paradigm or an, an, another form of conditioning that i had something i call pickup conditioning that um which is in the beginning good because um it gives you the right mindsets and kind of like the right focus and and direction and stuff like that but then that was always also something that you might call like um using a phone to get out another phone okay this bring me to from a to b but now that's a clear um that's a box basically that that's a, that's a limitation so this is this was, was more so i felt acting out inside this thing oh, I, 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 I didn't want to anymore it was just it felt as my old self so but mm -hmm. then i needed to unplug myself again from that because otherwise i would have acted out the old habits sub unconsciously so i needed a time to really go into monk mode to unplug myself completely and then come back just being myself and of course yeah. The, the only advice in dating is just be yourself. Or just exactly. Be, yeah. There's no yeah. other advice, but when you yeah, exactly, say this yeah. to someone who has like social anxiety and, and can't talk to a woman, for example, that's not practical. So you need to kind of look where, where he is and kind of attune to that, right? But in the end, just be yourself. What does that mean? Right, right. <laughs> be aligned to nature. Be aligned yeah. to your, like, you know, the, the path of least resistance. Yeah. 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 And that, mm -hmm. that also goes in how, like, when, when sometimes people ask, you know, how do I know if I'm doing things for the ego or, or for yeah. truth? You know? yeah. Just go to the body. The body will tell you. Exactly. It's very simple. When you exactly. feel authentic, like, you know, the body contracts. Yeah. So you can say the whole path is about releasing that contraction from inauthenticity of the ego to the authenticity of nature itself. Yeah. If you don't have any contractions anywhere. Every moment is, is sincere, is aligned. Yeah. 100% yeah. for, for me, for example, I sometimes I, I watch your Instagram stories, which are always interesting with the question you answer. And sometimes I, what comes up with the, is the topic of semen retention, right? And so oh, right, right. People, people are asking, for example, is semen retention helpful or necessary in realizing? And I know that your take is more, doesn't matter, right? That's at least what I got of it in, in general. Yeah. So, yeah. um, what? but but in terms of um, feeling into the body, I, for example, um, saw um, on on my personal journey when I'm, for example, on um, on, on seam retention, and this helped me to. Th th there are people they they do it out of ego fueling, like personal desire more. It's like okay, when I'm in seam retention, I have these powers, and then I'm more yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that, the, that's it's one, that's from one the thing. exactly. Yeah, it's they're creating a no fabric identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and then oh no, I'm day thirty, and now I fat. Yeah, yeah. Fuck right. no, I'm at zero yeah, yeah, yeah. And you need to stay yeah. off. that's also yeah. a paradigm that you can get yeah, yeah, yeah. of course yeah, yeah. you need to release yeah. that otherwise this, yeah. this will haunt you until you release it right so, yeah yeah and, and then but there's also um a way of unpersonal desire where, as my, where i for example feel okay what, what is the rhythm of my body how right. often does my body want to ejaculate without the pull of craving for example like what is my real sex drive supposed to my which is of course like testosterone in the body but there's also one thing of like there's also this addictive component and the more i release that also on my um, spiritual journey then it turned out that semen retention made me more um i felt more subtlety so i felt more what women do i have really genuine attraction versus where do i just feel the pull to ejaculate into right and i could see ah okay um and this is something um this is something more authentic, for example. Right, right, right. I feel, I yeah. feel, I feel an energy, and I go to the energy. Versus before, it was more like, okay, she's a nice ass, a nice, nice tits, but, and and I'm kind of not. I I just acting out of my cock without my cock being integrated to the rest of my body, kind of. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 That that's the paradigm. Is the um. So uh, back then, when I was uh, addicted to sex at one phase. Um, a lot of that addiction didn't come from just the body's natural response to sexuality or the natural's uh, the body's natural response to arousal. It's actually coming a lot of it is coming from this paradigm of wanting to be seen as this guy or wanted to tell myself like I can pick up women because yeah. like, I couldn't get girls like I said early in high school. So that part of me was deficient and I was uh, spent like my twenties making up for that. So like sometimes I wasn't even horny, but like the 
the desire came from the paradigm of wanting to appear to myself and to others that uh, I'm masculine. Yeah. So when that went away, actually, the, my desire, my craving for sex just dropped by like 95%, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and that that's so interesting because for me, um, I also, um, there was a certain stage in my thing where I was really in this materialistic view of sexuality in terms of yeah it always correlates with how high your testosterone is and you need to have a high testosterone in order to be successful and to be dominant and really assertive mm -hmm. and stuff like that and really like re reductional to this one um hormone and I, I also see a whole there's a whole like community and and mm -hmm. uh, subculture of men being locked in into this um beliefs and yeah that for me was also um funny enough exactly like that that before it was i really looked what was my sex drive kind of um linked into i think mm -hmm. for me, it was more like being able to access like the yeah like like the feeling of being powerful what was definitely something but also like have i really access to the full kind of sexual expression that i want to have and right, that, right. that can translate into creativity as well and how i want to impact the world of course right, right. Like and, we say, it's the same. It's the same energy. It's the same energy, but then yeah. sometimes it gets like um, subliminated, or or it it it, it turns um, um, or, or what's the right word? What's the right um, sentence? It um, goes into the direction, for example, of of porn. So it it goes on a more I don't want to call it low consciousness, but more it doesn't really find like realizes itself in, in what it actually tries to to create or try to try to express and um yeah this was definitely interesting for me to see the more i released that and um, there was phases where i definitely had uh, where all of a sudden i don't, didn't have libido anymore but then i checked my testosterone levels and they were all fine so it wasn't <laughs> right, right right you know right. what i mean yeah, yeah totally yeah <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, also interesting yeah hmm. um i what uh, one phrase that really catched me in one of your videos was where you said for me making videos is a way for me to have sex with the whole world because everything's so beautiful that i just want to fuck everything but i can't so i can only do it with my camera Drink my mental cup. what we say in like for example in um, shadow work where it's always about okay integrating the, as the, the aspects that want to integrate working mm. for example with porn addiction something is always okay what kind of life force potential are you trying to access here right mm -hmm. and this can be a, a, like creativity this can be um, feelings of um, being powerful for example right and but of course sex is also about yeah, like intimacy and union in right. like right. like in the up in the most absolute sense right so i think also what at least as i um, perceive it in your case is that starting from um experiences of sex addiction and then going on the spiritual journey kind of transmuting them or letting go of that and um, it, it it seems like there was literally like this um evolution happening also on, in in regards to your relationship to to sex right where in the end of course it's yeah. fully consciously that oh actually the whole universe is having sex with itself all with the time itself, yeah, yeah this is what i wanted to find out up in the beginning if infinity does not include paradoxes and contradictions, it's not infinite, is it? When I look at a cup, it's completely holographic. Penetrate through it on and on along with all the other objects in this room and sensations, sight, sound, thoughts, body, emotions, whatever. And it's like this luminous, boundless hologram, 360 degrees, and it's just perceiving itself in unity, simultaneously, without any delay. Without the separate watcher, the distinction between a subject and an object collapsed. There's only reality or the source experiencing itself. So the point is to access every stratum of the mind or consciousness, and then disidentify and descend back more from external freedom. That's why you wanted to do it in the beginning, when we do pickup, or even when you try to create yeah. artwork, you just wanted to fuck something. Yes. Because this, this life force has everything to do with uh, sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, because the, the nature's creative energy, how, how does nature propagate itself through reproduction and, and sex, right? So, all kinds of desires you have is rooted in sexuality. And the sexuality is rooted in nature's desire to just create itself, fox itself moment to moment. That's how it manifests existence. That same energy gives rise to the Big Bang. 
and the big crunch as well. By this non-existent thread, that's connecting all the other holograms through infinite webs of conditioning. And when I cycle my legs, it feels like it's the doing of the entire universe. But that's what's happening to everyone by itself and there's nobody doing it. The body, the mind, sensations, perceptions, source, awareness, the world, the skies, they're all the same one no thing to me right now. See, thoughts were never inside the head and you were never inside the body. It doesn't feel like my eyes are looking out through the world or my ears are hearing anymore. It feels like there's just one singular sense store, quote unquote, God sense store, <laughs> and it's comprehending itself. Whatever is arising is passing away simultaneously and everything is free falling in the center of infinity as infinity. So nothing has a center. It's again, going back to the creative destruction, you know, Freud, Sigma Freud said we have the sex and the death drive. Yeah. So at yeah. the end, in Antwali, you merge everything, you know, the sex and love and death and life. It's all just one thing, really. Yeah. Yeah. When this is the one thing, you become less fixated on just the pure um, element of a penis sticking itself into a vagina. Of course, that's part of it as well. Mm -hmm. You're not rejecting mm -hmm. that part of it. But when the fixation on that is gone, every moment can feel like it's just the universe having sex with itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then if you yeah. talk about the, the, the state of like Nirvana, it's kind of like a post um, orgasmic state. And like I said earlier, you know, we're kind of afraid of pleasure the same way we, we love pain. Right. So the only reason why we want to have sex, actually, the ultimate reason is to release a contraction. So we're not really going for the orgasm. We're actually going for the post orgasmic state. That's state of equanimity. Yeah. And that's why I said, you know, love at the ultimate level feels like, um, you're transmuting this personal love from a woman to a man or vice versa and smeared up across the whole universe. So it's like an orgasm that's smeared up into infinity, which is not contracted anyway. It's not a state anymore. It's not a temporary state. It becomes like this post-orgasmic state, this love, condition, unconditional love that just smears across uh, the universe. And it is just the universe itself. And that energy of love gives rise to, you know, you know, the big bang and the big crunch and, you know, to all the individual species uh, desire to uh, procreate. Yeah. yeah. So one, one driving question for me is always like, I, I take the assumption that this is true. And from the vantage point of my current state of consciousness or my symptoms or, or my, how, how I am like put together in terms of my psychology and, and way of or my self image. Um, I always then ask myself, how does this link to this truth, right? So for example, when now, now I have cravings, then I can see, okay, how is the craving actually trying to get me there? But this mm -hmm. is always this helps me kind of to kind of always like map out already the territory tori, of what the symptom or the trigger or the shadow thing coming up actually tries to get me. Because otherwise it feels like some something ne negative has you or something destructive or something like maybe demonic or something that that's bad or morally wrong or something like that for example um in in really specific um terms when i sometimes i work with clients where we open this field a bit up of of sexuality and then they enter a layer that is for example they enter the inner saddest right but that's the masochist and the saddest and the saddest maybe they they see then there's a tendency oh but when i express myself in that way am i harming someone am i hurting someone Right. And of course, they don't want to since they they're like good guys or good girls or and they 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 have a moral view on that. And um, but then it's also the, asking a question of, OK, but actually, let's see when when we really see this with love and and we stay in integrity and but we do it consciously. Actually, the sadistic force is also just trying to free up conscious like fuck life open, like to free mm -hmm. everything up in order to bring you there, even if it feels out of an ego, more moralistic perspective, more dark or more negative. Or I literally saw it like in psychedelic trips as like three demons. Like it's and but it's and then you work through the demons and they all transform into beautiful things. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. Like static creatures that are that can create stuff that are potent. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Total sense of compassion for all beings. Understanding that even though we could be instantly fully enlightened and just disappear from the Saha world at any moment because of our innate Buddha, instead we're not going 
to just leave everybody behind. It's no being left behind on this boat. We're going to have total confidence in our empathy, kind of lose the compassion for all sentient beings, but rather we... Uh, Every particle in this field contains the whole. It's like totally aware and awake the future and the past, even the now, are all condensed into the singularity. Literally every nano corner of this diamond room extends outward infinitely. It's, it's me and you. Like, how did I even believe that I was this little thing in here? Frank Yang thing. This is, this is fucked up. <laughs> this is so fucking crazy. <laughs> like, there's no mind. There's no consciousness even. It's just, this is fucking... I thought the shift I had before was huge. This is... This is, this feels, this feels total. Like every little point is, con, is connected, that there's no points anymore. Like before there's still some subtle solidity here, here, there, there, that sometimes I deconstruct and then there's no separation during meditation. But now it's just, it's just, it's just full. It's just, it's empty and full. It's just it's like, what the fuck? It's like I can't imagine ever going back to the way I was before. Like, there's no way, like this is not gonna be permanent. This this space here that it, it's just like it just it, it's I can't explain it. It's, it's when I meditate before while I was doing vipassana, I'm scanning my body like this. But now I'm scanning like the the way I scan it. It's like infinite. It's like the whole universe going like this, and then like, and I just have to close my eyes, and then it's like it's like. And I don't even have to scan actually. I can just sit here and then it's like it, it's really hard to describe. It's just like it's 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 that the whole world is going through me and out of me. But that's not even the right description because there's this this Mitsu here is part of that emptiness. It's hologram hologram. Void on void, infinity on infinity, which means that there's nothing to say. This this is but there's so much to say. I, there, there's there's a billion words that could be used to describe this, and it's still not gonna touch it. But then, it, it's. But then words are just empty too. This this makes LSD, <laughs> DMT even seem like baby. It's not an experience. It transcends experiences. The whole universe eating itself through and through, like a cosmic snake, one of those symbols, you know? Biting its own tail, strange looping to infinity. It's infinite, 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 infinite love, infinite pancakes, infinite God. It just get boom, swallowed out by the void. Boom. My body, boom. My thought, boom. Of course you're not your mind. There is, is no mind, there is no mind. Of course, this, this this eternal stillness. Even if you have a million thoughts, a million sensations, a million sounds, a million bodies, they're 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 they're, in, they're completely still and silent and empty. Or they can be completely loud. It doesn't even matter. There's no there's no mind to silent. There's no body to say this is not my body. We can um, bring this um, conversation to an end with maybe giving from here some practical steps on mm -hmm. how people can start what to do with all that that we just covered right on their journeys when they're like in shadow work or on a meditation journey um yeah where, um, where, to, where to start 
Uh, you mean someone who is just starting or like um, that's a little bit too, too yeah, general. Yeah. It, it, you, 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 it, you, it, it depends, right? Right. You, but, so, well, I mean, yeah, it depends. But usually if people just ask me that out of the blue, I, I just tell them that um, for practice wise, um, again, like I said earlier, there's just sort of two sides of the spectrum that you have to you know cover, you know, the expansion and contraction. And we're going to talk about that. But then there's also self-inquiry or, or, or shadow work and psychedelics. So it's almost like a triangle, you know, you got the expansion, the contraction, you know, working with the insight, you know, so, and then of course the, the uh, uh, you know, the, you can also have to, to deepen those uh, contracting expansion, uh, which not only do they feed on each other, the more you can expand, the more you can contract and vice versa, because the mind is kind of like rubber band. You know, if you can concentrate more, the more you can release, like go and enter the limitless space of consciousness. But then there's also, you know, self-inquiry or psychedelics or even shadow work. That's kind of like on the other, you know, if you make a, if you see this a triangle, they can also feed on each other. You know, the more concentrated you are, the more concentrating power you have, the more you can do self-inquiry more efficiently. Um, and the more your psychedelic trips are going to be more insightful. Yeah. yeah. And the more you shadow work, the more you, when you work with the content, uh, the more you know exactly what you're doing and which content to discard, which content is useful to work with and things like that. Yeah. So basically, I think the most practical thing here, I think that we covered is kind of mapping out the territory a bit in order to mm -hmm. kind of let your intuition guide you where right, the right. piece of the puzzle kind of is just out of right. resonance, just because resonance is always, uh, most of the time, at least pointing towards truth or yeah. something significant. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, from each... there on, of course, there are different sources that we can't go yeah. into depth right now. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So like different brains respond to truth differently, you know, yeah. different brains, different practices. So um, you just got to see what works for you. And, you know, for people that um, just don't really have a good idea of what to do, I would just say, you know, try everything out and see what works for you. And yeah. then yeah. the most important thing isn't the practice itself, because all practices are just, you know, means to an end. They're just catalysts. They're just anchors. Eventually you have to like use one anchor to dissolve another anchor until all anchors dissolve themselves. But before, like, you know, but before you can really know exactly which practice and which combination of practices do for you, um, just try them out and see which one works. And the most important thing is to find the interconnectivity between the different practices. Mm -hmm. You're going to find the similarity between our practices and, and, and finally realize that there's only one practice at the end. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. a, I mean, begin with the end of mind, right? You can start yeah, exactly. with the assumption right there. Yeah. And right. about closing yourself down to one specific path. And I think then right. you're on a good yeah, path already. Yeah. 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 So what, what just came to my mind also was um, as sometimes I also encounter people that, and for example, um, they're really into non-dual theory. And for example, um, they, they read books, for example, from Daniel Ingram and stuff, which, and, and he's a total genius in his field, right? And then he has this really like detailed and scientific view. And, but then they sometimes complain a bit that they stuck in like a dry territory, that it's uh, too mental. Yeah. And, and, then, yeah, of course that... <laughs> and then I always advise them, okay, to go a bit more into the artistic kind of way. Yeah, exactly. And, the yeah. and maybe also through art or through, through mm -hmm. a hero's journey of, um, okay, and that's a, something at least that helped me to really see when I follow my heart, also in my like career or business or in every aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. Like that's, yeah, exactly. also that's also meditation, like your creative path and expressing yeah. that every time you create something that's out of your heart, you also dissolve something um, from like even creating this right now um, with, with you together, right? This was for me also, okay, I, I, <laughs> I, I dissolve stuff that I bring out when I edit a video, it takes like maybe like a month. Mm. And that, that process, it's almost like, you know, um, what's that process where you, the baby's in your womb and then it's growing? Birthing. Birthing, before birthing, there's a process. So once you give birth to a child, that's like us releasing a video. Mm -hmm. And we're really passionate about that video because it's almost like our child, our thought, we shape that, that thought and we shape, we're shaping that organism. Mm -hmm. and we, that's why I always get kind of like there's a post uh, more depression mm. that you get after you release a big video mm. because your child is out there and it's uh, getting stepped on, it's getting loved, whatever. It's like mm. sending your child off to college and into the world. Yeah. So 
not having just a really scientific and um, structured view that um, tends to be limited by or, or get get dry and um, but like yeah finding ways to enrich and um, yeah g like yeah. Give, give, give this more juice so to speak yeah, yeah exactly you, also you just going back to the expansion contraction part like some people they people who are too into the concentration aspect of the practice and I usually tell them to do more like expansion part. If you're like the type of people that, you know, they're really good at, you know, just sit and st sit and do nothing and just do a lot of the, the just sit kind of practice, the Dzogchen and stuff like that, the awareness of awareness practice. And they still have a lot of solidities in the center and they still have a lot of, um, they, they still can't see the insights into the more microscopic details of reality, like impermanence and stuff like that. And then I'll just tell them to do more uh, practice on the contraction aspect of the equation, like do more mm -hmm. compassion. And if you, or some people are like, like you said, too scientific, and too dry, you know, do some, do some psychedelics. Yeah. 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 Do some psychedelics. Or, that's that's a, a, one, yeah. yeah. Daniel Ingram said he's never done psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So like, I actually think if he do some psychedelics, he will have, um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't tell, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I, I did a mushroom trip. I think I really, really intense one five days ago. And yeah, this is always having access to it on um, like it, it's really like you have a skeleton and then mm -hmm. you really get the flesh on so to speak and yeah that's an interesting way to put it and like people like leo gura would be like you know maybe he should do a little bit more vipassana or like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just i mean i mean I, I, i'm just making it up i i don't know yeah. how they're or anything exactly. like that and say, if someone is like a leo Gore or like a Diana ingram and they ask me what practice i should do i would tell them <laughs> if you're too into the models and too into the insights so i'm not talking about them specifically i'm just using it as an example if you are a type of guy who is just too scientific about your approach too systematic too pragmatic even you know like you said do some creativity stuff you know go go do some pickup or whatever you know do some tantra stuff or, or yeah. psychedelics and things like that yeah Ex yeah some, some people are too much on the other side too they're too like critical right brain you know there are a lot of the people that are, um yeah they're too you know they're like their thinking is all over the place and they're just trying everything out and they're too into the crystals and the, and the mm. kind of leaning out. i'm like hey read some daniel ingram you know <laughs> sort of understand yeah. the, the, the structure of the path a little bit more you know like become more scientific in your approach your practice and things like that so different yeah. people Different things have different weak points, just like fitness. It's exactly like fitness. Some people are too strong and they're not quick enough. Do some of polymetrics. Some people are naturally yeah. very fast, very reactive. They don't have strength, you know, uh, to squat some more. You know, you always got to combine um, strength with speed to create power. And for meditation too, you know, the, the power comes from the, the, the perfect blending of expansion and contraction. Yeah. yeah. So it really seems to finding also effort perfect, and effortlessness, you know. Exactly, yeah. finding that like perfect balance and the sweet yeah. spot in the, the sweet spot. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. The middle way. That's what Buddha's first discourse is called. The middle, middle way. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, even then, when when I tell um, tell clients that, for example, they confuse that with being average, so they don't see the magic that happens in the sweet spot. Or actually, they sure. think like when okay, there's the extremes and they bring me high, but no, like the extremes actually they okay in the beginning they take you high maybe but then they crush at some point but finding yeah. the, the balance between the different kind of yeah um things it's actually something that's yeah yeah so for me the middle way is about, the middle way is not the average point really the, the yeah. middle way is what brings together and collapses the two extremes yeah which transcends both out of the extreme and then but also includes and gives rise to it so going back to the beginning of the of our call when we were talking about pleasure and pain or like you know um contraction and expansion or yeah. whatever it, it, it's the space that gives rise to both sides of the duality but also is apart from it so that's not a paradox yeah it's the same but also different yeah yeah so that's i think that's a good one yeah finding really the finding um, the balance mm -hmm. and kind of yeah. having gaining awareness on where the the, the personal disbalances are right that that can be a huge one and um, for sure so that you don't dig yourself deeper in a hole you already are and doing that for months or years that can mm -hmm. happen right uh, but even if that happens that should happen right there's not nothing to judge here um, yeah. of course <laughs> yes 
And yeah, of course, what you said also with the crystals person and the really spiritual yeah, yeah. person, no, no, they, they need more grounding, right? They, yeah, 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 yeah. they want to transcend my humanity and the human body, but then it's like, okay, that's resistance to reality. In fact, exactly. yes, you are, and as there's a human body that needs to get mm -hmm. loved and nourished. And right. what do we need to give you to bring you more here? Right, right. Yeah. And right. for others, it's like, I'm just the body and, and then, okay, let's look more on the more out of the box kind of territory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why it's like people who are like super into non-duality, they watch like hundreds of hours of non-duality video, but they're still struggling. Um, they still haven't seen through the self or uh, access the non-dual awareness or emptiness. Um, I, I would tell them something like, Hey, you know, enlightenment is actually a physical transformation. You know, you're physically dissolving the solidity in the body. Go lift some weights. Go do some body scanning, right? So, and there are people who are like too into that. And I'm just like, hey, do some self-inquiry. Like people who are yeah. really into Vipassana, they, they have the very solidified Vipassana lives. They're very good at doing Vipassana. But if they haven't seen through the self, hey, do some uh, self-inquiry. Yeah. Become yeah. more mental yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're still very identified with thoughts, some of those people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so... Yeah, great, man. Um, yeah, great conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Hmm. So you want to wrap it up here? Yeah, I think we're. I think that was a perfect spot to end. Yeah, great. Yeah. So yeah, yeah thank you, Frank, for your time you, and yeah. and just for your being and your and your presence. Thank you. You too. Yeah. You too. Thank you for this uh, opportunity for to share some of those uh, experiences. And insights yeah. and yeah maybe in the end you want to share a bit what what you're doing how people can reach out to you what you what you offer right oh, okay yeah yeah sure i mean you can find me on on youtube um youtube.com slash frank yang you just type in frank yang on youtube you'll see my channel on um, instagram is bean underscore frank underscore yang i'm pretty active on on instagram but youtube too um i, I don't upload that often but you know, I, I, I'm still pretty active on there, but um, that's pretty much the only uh, platforms that are used right now. Um, I have a website, frankian.wtf, fuck, and then you can find my coaching information on there. I do like one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultants and uh, what I call consciousness coaching. I also do fitness coaching as well. Uh, sometimes people do both, but yeah, that's where you can find me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You yeah I'm just uh, enjoying, uh, I'm just, uh, what's that? You want to do a last flex? Oh, uh, <laughs> there we go <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be completely alone and realize that ultimately there's no relationship because there's nothing outside of you before you could be intimate with a million things see with self-realization at the end it's just you it's a war against yourself at the end it's a total acceptance that nobody's going to walk the path with you even if they're around you Nobody's going to truly understand what you've been through because it's your own path to walk, right? But when you come out of the side, you become totally accepting of everyone. Now come the days of the king. Then the heart prays, then the heart shines, then the heart sings.